Fossils and Fiction, a show about ancient life, paleontology, and the stories we tell. The show is produced by me, Travis Holland, on Wiradjuri Country, with the support of Charles Sturt University. Enjoy! Welcome to Fossils and Fiction for 2024. It's been a long, hot Australian summer, and I've been working hard to bring new podcast episodes to life. In this first episode of the year, I've gotten my hands on a copy of a new academic book all about Jurassic Park. Funnily enough, it is called the Jurassic Park Book. This is the first episode in a two-part series speaking with contributors to the book. First up, we have the editor, Dr. Matt Melia from Kingston University in the UK, and Peter Kramer from De Montfort University, also in the UK. In future episodes, I will have another couple of contributors, but it may be a few weeks down the line. In the meantime, enjoy this one and more to come. I am Matt Melia. Uh, I'm, I'm a senior lecturer at Kingston University in sort of film, media and English lit. The Jurassic Park book is a comprehensive study of this landmark film 30 years after its release. What mm. motivated you to put together the work? In the sort of short term, I suppose, it was a sequel to the, the Jaws book. It came out, I think, in 2020 uh, from Bloomsbury, a uh, sort of edited collection on Jaws. Uh, but really, it, it kind of stems from my own sort of personal love of the film, my own sort of history with it. Um, it's a film which had a, a really big impact on me. Um, I saw it on its opening night back in 1993 at a, a cinema in Waterloo, Crosby, and on, on Merseyside uh, in the UK. Um, a cinema called the Plaza Plaza Cinema is now a community cinema. Uh, it's really, uh, really, really great place. So give, give a bit of a shout out to that. But it was a really sort of big moment in my sort of cinema, uh, sort of cinema going life, I suppose. Uh, the first big event movie, which I'd sort of experienced at that time, I was probably about 14, 15, something like that. So it had a big, big impact, a uh, big impact on me, really. I remember sort of, and I can mention this in the book, um, turning up at the cinema and, and, and the queue being all the way down the the street and sort of round the corner into the next street. Uh, I hadn't seen anything like it. So it was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, I suppose kind of for people like me who are that little bit too young for both Jaws and Star Wars the first time round, this was our kind of, this was our version of that. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of, that, 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 that was important for me because it, it, it was in, I, I sort of enjoyed getting into that really, and sort of remembering that moment. Um, but also, I think kind of we should celebrate kind of popular cinema. I think a lot of attention is paid to, you know, important art films or, you know, what have you, and that's that, 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 that's great. But I think kind of there is a movement, there is a moment at the minute where popular cinema is coming more into focus, mm-hmm. I think. There's a nostalgia, I think, for the 1990s which the book kind of segues with as well. For instance, uh, 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 re- there's been a recent book published um, on the uh, 30 Years of the X-Files, mm-hmm. um, which kind of Jurassic Park is sort of concurrent with. Um, so I think that's that's really interesting. There's a kind of moment which we wanted to hit uh, for that 30th anniversary. The book is a sort of natural progression as well from the Jaws book. Um which we, as I said, we published in 2020. Um, uh, I, I edited that with a, a colleague. Uh, I did this one uh, sort of by myself, but it's, it started off as, as a sort of mutual project between us, and then he stepped back and I sort of took it over. I'm currently working on uh, a third book or put, putting a proposal together for a third book on E.T., uh, so, because what, what I'd like to do is have a trilogy of books on Spielberg's three big, uh, yeah. three, three, three big blockbusters, uh, and see where it goes from there. Um, so we've done the 
Joe's book is a kind of natural progression. The Joe Jurassic Park was a, as a book is a kind of natural progression to the uh, from the Jaws book, I suppose. Um, I think as well, while, while all the major moments of popular cinema have sort of captured the the imagination and sort of been celebrated in sort of critical writing, sort of notably Star Wars, for instance, there's been precious little work actually dedicated to Jurassic Park or to um, Jaws, for that matter, uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and nothing really written around E.T. And I think that's because, and Linda Ruth Williams, Professor Linda Ruth Williams sort of mentions this in her forward to the book, um, Spielberg wasn't really taken seriously as someone to be studied uh, due to the, the, the sort of you know, spectacular, popular mainstream nature of the work he was seen as a kind of uh offshoot of that kind of uh american new wave of the 1970s um and sort of leading america leading cinema kind of out of the new wave into this new era of the blockbuster i think he, he, he's suffered from criticisms of being overly sentimental and uh family oriented that sort of thing but i don't think i think kind of that's misleading because there's a real darkness to Spielberg's work. Yeah. It, it would be a mistake just to say that Spielberg is mm. family on because he does have these kinds of um, horror elements laced through, through most of his films and, and uh, Jurassic Park's a great example of that, but absolutely, what really captures your attention about Spielberg? If this is your sort of second of, of hopefully three books uh, focused on his work, what, what brings you back to him? Is it is it that? Is it uh, repositioning his role in culture or in cinema history there? Or yeah, is there I mean, something I mean, about I, his work? I think that's really um, that's really important. Uh, so you know, the, I mean, people like Peter Kramer uh, have been sort of repositioning Spielberg and sort of you know celebrating kind of blockbuster cinema and sort of writing critically about blockbuster cinema in really interesting ways, but. Um, I think it's yeah. I think it is important to sort of uh, bring him, you know, reposition him as a sort of major auteur, if you like, of, uh, of cinema. Sort of in doing so, highlight the importance of popular cinema. I think that's the because mm-hmm. that, that's what brings us together, right? That's what brings people together. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's a bit of a mistake from uh, critics and the Academy to ignore the things that most people want to engage with uh i think if you know it it can be it can be problematic to ignore something just because it's popular (laughs) i guess absolutely yeah Uh, Mm. absolutely i think as well so i was born in 1978 so I've, i've not known a world without steven spielberg uh he i mean he 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 sort of defines popular the popular cinematic experience for me anyway um so and i've loved spielberg's film since i was a kid i mean he's synonymous not just with popular cinema you know with cinema itself spielberg invented a kind of new visual grammar for popular cinema particularly in the way that he uses light for instance which has been sort of discussed by various people um and i think as well in an era when the way we watch films has been so varied and diversified, you know, films are destined for streaming services or mobile devices. Spielberg's cinema remains kind of resolutely cinematic. You know, the, the place to watch it is in the cinema. They're, they're sort of love letters to cinema and the cinematic experience itself. I don't know if you saw The Fablemans recently, um, but that was all about, you know, his own love of, love of cinema you know it was a kind of semi-autobiographical mm-hmm. film about 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 his own relationship with cinema and, and, and his family but i think kind of jurassic park is kind of testament to this um kind of commentary on cinema i mean it's been discussed before but that moment in the film where they arrive in jurassic park and encounter the brachiosaurus eating from the top of the tree um that's a really important moment because I think what he's doing there is he's kind of filtering our experience, mm-hmm. you know, our own uh, astonishment 
at the kind of visual effects that are being implemented by ILM there, you know, this uh, this great spectacle, you know, our, our, our sort of awe at the, the spectacle of cinema is kind of, a, is being sort of filtered to the, this, the image on screen. Um, what was maybe interesting about that shot is you write it, of course, it was a digital digital shot, but uh, it was filmed as if it was a practical shot with that kind of forced perspective angle. You, you're yeah. looking at the brachiosaur from the from the human perspective to, yeah. to make it look like a, a truly magnificent or, or um, giant creature. Yeah. And uh, that probably speaks to that grandeur that he sort of captured in, in Jurassic Park with... Um, with all of the larger dinosaurs, certainly. So, no, absolutely. I and mean, I think, I think what's interesting as well, and um, is that if you take somebody's uh, 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 somebody like Tom Gunning, who writes about early cinema and what he calls the cinema of attractions, that moment in the sort of the early days of the evolution of you know, cinema, cinematic technology and sort of viewing. And he says, you know, people w- would go to marvel at the processes by which the image appears, you know, the technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that Jurassic Park is really rooted back in that early kind of cinema of attractions, you know, particularly in that moment, because it comes out, you know, it's a pivotal moment for digital effects. There's only, I think, six minutes of the actual film that are that are CGI. Yeah. Uh, the rest is animatronic, so it's kind of seamlessly merged with these these, these animatronics. I, I still think it, it looks really good now, to be honest with you. I was watching it again the other day. But I think... It, kind it of, definitely it, holds up, yeah. Yeah. And, and we... It's, you know... It's astonishing to look at for that for that reason. So I think kind of the that that sort of kind of going back to the cinema of attractions is is, is a sort of interesting way of thinking about it. Spielberg really did. Uh, he he made this film a love letter to a lot of genre films in in the same vein. I think um, he really played on King Kong and the Old Lost World and yeah. all of those kinds of films that he loved as a as a kid. Uh, yeah. and sort of tried to reinvoke that same sense of awe um, as he was filming it. Now, um, the book, the the Jurassic Park book, there's lots of contributions from uh, from a wide variety of yeah. authors, and we'll I'm going to talk to some of those other authors as well. But you, as the editor, Matt, could you see any major themes or through lines in the book? What really captured the contributors in putting the book together? Well, it's an interesting question um, because the I, I think the the contributions from all the um, the, uh, the 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 authors are really different. You know, they they they, they look at it from different ways. Uh, I think one of the draws of the book is the sort of diversity of approaches. So there's contributors from film studies, musicologists, adaptation studies, fan studies paleontologists are in there, uh, theme park studies. There's a real variety. Um, I was trying to identify some of the kind of through themes. Uh, the digital effects are certainly a, a preoccupation with many of the authors in the book. I think as well it's um, relationship to Jaws as mm-hmm. well. is is something that is uh, dealt with across across the book as well. Could you touch um, on that a little bit? What what how what does Spielberg draw from Jaws maybe and and use in Jurassic Park? Jurassic. I mean, for those of us too young to see Jaws first time round, this was sort of our equivalent, I think. Um, Jurassic Park, I think, it is Spielberg returning to the kind of Corman esque Roger Corman esque creature feature that mm-hmm. he sort of um, created with Jaws. And uh, with Jaws, he was. Um, when he was asked about that film, he said he was basically trying to make a Roger Corman film, which I think is really interesting because both Jaws and Jurassic Park um, gave birth to lots of like little mini exploitation, shark films and dino films. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Jaws more so than Jurassic Park, but one particular one was uh, in the wake of Jurassic Park, it was a film called Carnosaur, uh, which was produced by Roger Corman and stars none other than Diane Ladd, who is Laura Dern's mother. Uh, so I thought that, that was quite an interesting little uh, little, little tidbit. Uh, it adapts all sorts of themes from Jaws, I think. So you have kind of man against nature, our own place in the food chain. Uh, both of the films deal with sort of out of place prehistoric monsters who threaten a kind of island community governed by naive and hubristic community leaders, so to speak. Um, there are also kind of clear correspondences in uh, characters. So you have the kind of heroic everyman in sort of Roy Scheider as Brody and Sam Neill as um, Alan Grant. Um, you have that kind of trilogy of, 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 of characters, I think, you know, the Hooper, the sort of nebbish intellectual is sort of the equivalent of Goldblum's uh, Ian Malcolm. Mm-hmm. You even have a kind of Quintesque like character in um, Muldoon, the, uh, the, 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 the the dinosaur hunter in the film. Or, or... Yeah, the, the Great White Hunter, the notion of the Great White Hunter Ooh. is something I picked up on a in a chapter I wrote recently. Um it's a it's a real trope in in the creature films, but it it is also one that flows through Jurassic Park, uh, absolutely and through the, yeah. through the whole franchise. Yeah, yeah. I mean that idea of a kind of white imperialism. Uh, Richard Attenborough in this kind of almost like white safari suit, <laughs> as the as the sort of the uh, you know the, the, the great sort of you know uh, the great explorer, you know, almost like. Um, one of those kind of old, you know, explorers from history, you know. But um, uh, so that's that was one thing. But I uh, also think, kind of, in terms of the impact that it had, um, certainly in terms of merchandising, um, both of these films kind of had a you know huge kind of pioneering uh, approach to merchandising. Uh, and a, a massive merchandising blitz. They created a kind of monster mania. One of the interesting things about, and this is written, written about in the book, certainly in the chapter uh, on merchandising by uh, uh, Tom Livingston, is that um, when you go into the gift shop in the film, all those products that you see on the shelf are real-life products. Yep. available to buy. <laughs> they are the merchandising for the film. Um, so I think that's, that's a really interesting kind of, uh, almost a bit of self-reflection there, I think. You know, you did, there was, you know it, it, with both films, if you could slap Jurassic Park or Jaws on something, then it would be on there. You know, with Jaws, there was even, you know, Jaws ice cream. Um, there was, you know, it, 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 you know Jaws opened the way for the Star Wars merchandising, and, and that sort of it also in turn sort of opened the way for the uh, the um, Jurassic Park approach to merchandising. Sort of approach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and, and the, I mean, there's there's tons of kind of thematic and uh, sort of wider ways in which Jaws kind of influences Jurassic Park or you know, or, or prompts Jurassic Park. Um, I think uh, one of the interesting things about Jurassic Park is it, it, it is the it sort of awareness of the dangers of kind of neoliberal free market economics and the sort of the all-consuming, devouring uh, sort of you know capitalism, of which it knows it's it's a part of. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so there is a kind of self-awareness there, you know. That's an interesting move that Spielberg often. Uh, makes or it well he certainly made in in Jurassic Park right in, in making that point um, I wonder the extent to which that came from Crichton uh, versus versus Spielberg you know that that notion of um, critiquing the system you're part of in a sense yeah I mean I, th- I think it's definitely there I mean, we. I think we have to take when we think about Jurassic Park as a Spielberg film. We also have to think about it as a sort of Michael Crichton film as well. It was. A, it was a. It was a sort of important to Crichton as it was to Spielberg. Uh, Spielberg hadn't had a hit since nineteen eighty nine uh, with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, 
and his previous two films, which were Always and Hook, had mm. been had tanked. Uh, he'd had a horrible time making Hook. Uh, I think in an interview with Mark Kermo, the, the, the UK film critic, uh, he, he once said something like, you know, I look back on Hook and I can't think of anything I like about it. It's the only film I look back on and think I can't think of anything I like about it. <laughs> I uh, I think he said the same thing about the Lost World though. There were there were you know he he really found himself mired in in trying to tie that story up. Yeah, um, he didn't he didn't have a happy time making the Lost World either, um, which is I think why he turned over Jurassic Park three to Joe Johnson. Um, mm. uh, but, I, but but I always, it, yeah. But, but just just returning to the whole sort of Michael Crichton thing, because I think it's important. Michael Crichton, it, it, in the sort of early 90s, well, so from the 70s through to the sort of early 90s, Crichton was quite uh, quite the figure, really. He'd sort of made the Andromeda strain at the end of the 70s. Uh, he'd become known as both a kind of author and director of these kind of techno techno thrillers. Um and he'd made a sort of a name for himself in uh, in Hollywood, uh, writing and directing his own work, uh, particularly kind of Coma and Westworld, uh, mm-hmm. which is a really interesting film. It's sort of both the Terminator and Jurassic Park have the sort of the, the framework, the, the DNA of West, Westworld within them. Um, Brighton's kind of techno pessimism, I think, is is an important part of the film, it kind of stands with kind of Spielberg's kind of spectacle and uh, his own sort of themes. Um, he'd written, he'd met uh, Spielberg on the set of ER back in 1989, mm-hmm. um, back while the book was in its still in its develop, developmental stages, um, and there'd already been a, a, a kind of rush to try and you know, of directors who wanted to make the you know, turn it into a film. So people like James Cameron, uh, Tim Burton, Richard Donner, uh, Joe Dante had all shown an interest in it. But what's really interesting, I, I think, about this is, again, another comparison with Jaws, in which Benchley's novel was kind of bought up by the studio while it was still in the galley stages. So like like Jaws, Jurassic Park kind of went into kind of, you know, began its journey from script to screen before the book had even made it onto the shelves. Um, it, and Oliver Gruner writes in depth about the um, process of bringing the film to the screen and the book. It's really a detailed chapter. So Jurassic Park was really a, a kind of a rejuvenation for both Spielberg and Crichton. So in the wake of Jurassic Park, uh, there was a whole rush of uh, Michael Crichton adaptations a Rising Sun with Wesley Snipes and Sean Connery, which is a kind of detective film set in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Disclosure, a sort of uh, erotic uh, sexual harassment film. Uh, Congo, The Lost World, Jurassic Park, of course, which he sort of wrote usually afterwards. Um, and, and that was his first sequel, right? There was a, There'd never been a Crichton sequel before that. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the first, uh, the first sequel. Um, he um, Crichton had written the first, I think, first couple of drafts, script drafts of the film, uh, before it got turned over to Malia Scotch Marmo and then David Coep, um, who kind of wrote the final uh, draft of the film. So I mean, he's in there. Uh, he, you know, he, He's definitely still in there, you know. Yeah, he he, he kept his hand in. Uh, so, I mean, speaking of Crichton adaptations, I think uh, the one thing I'd like to see an adaptation of is Dragon Teeth, which is this kind of yeah. fictionalized telling of the Bone Wars uh, yeah. story. So it would be interesting to see <laughs> how somebody yeah, it's uh, really could, interesting. Could bring that actually. to life. Yeah, because he he wrote that. I think he wrote that in the seventies. 70s or 80s, but it didn't get published till after he died. Mm. So it was kind of published posthumously. Uh, so he does have this kind of interest in sort of paleontology, I think, uh, which tallies with Spielberg as well, I think. Yeah. Um, 
I've always seen Jurassic Park as this film that kind of defies genre. Um, it's a it's an action film and an adventure film and a horror film and a creature film and and an epic film and an event film. I think you called it also a family film. How, how did Spielberg do that? How does he draw those threads together? I think because. Hang on a second. I think because um, he himself was a sort of avid consumer of popular cinema, mm-hmm. you know, f- f- uh, as a child, he would make uh, he would make you know short films himself. You know, as, uh, uh, as a child, as, as a teenager, uh, he was he was a consumer of cinema. Uh, he was a consumer of genre cinema, and I think you know it goes back to his sort of, um, as, I suppose, kind of. His films being a kind of you know self-referential sort of love of the you know love of the medium, um, mm-hmm. in which he's able to kind of hybridize all these different uh, different genres within different films. So, for instance, I mean, with Jurassic Park, I mean Jennifer Shell in, uh, in in the book writes and identifies. You know, we talked about before kind of lost you know, the, the importance of lost world narratives as well, going back to. 1924's The Lost World and then sort of King Kong. Uh, I think about, in, in my own chapter in the book, about the debt to Irwin Allen's disaster movies of the 1970s mm-hmm. and in which they kind of anticipate the kind of, you know, the, the disaster renaissance of the 1990s in the run-up to the millennium. Horror cinema as well, you know, forms part of the generic matrix of the film, obviously. And I think, um, again, you can go back to Jaws here. Like if Jaws provides a kind of blueprint not only for the slasher movie, but also for Alien, then so you could sort of compare Jurassic Park to James Cameron's sequel, Aliens, with the sort of uh, velocity, the, the Velociraptors, which is interesting because Cameron had actually wanted to make the film, uh, yeah. and had I think we tried... would have got a very different film. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. When he said that, you know, he, he said in an interview that. He tried to buy the book rights, but had been beaten by beaten up by a sort of matter of hours to the punch by Spielberg. But in the end, he said, "You know, my my film certainly wouldn't have been a wouldn't have been a sort of family film." Uh, and, you know, I mean, the Lost World uh, lent into the horror a bit more, and then, of course, yeah. uh, quite famously, um, um, Fallen Kingdom did as well. The, mm. the the sequel to Jurassic World, it. Um, really played on those horror elements in a way none of the other Jurassic films uh, has done, I think. That whole sort of gothic, uh, you know, gothic castle and uh, the, the sort mm. of the, the, the creature stomping around on the, the roof and the sort of almost like the, the kind of haunted, the haunted mansion, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. And it plays in all those gothic tropes. Um, but I think it does so in a much more conscious way. Um than uh, than Jurassic Park, I think I think part of the scale of Spielberg's approach is to make a film which is a dinosaur film, but you know if you peel back the layers, it has all these other things kind of beneath the surface, you know, which kind of make yeah. up what you're seeing. Uh, it, it, it's yeah, I think it's interesting uh, to uh, that that, uh, that approach. I think as well. I mean, one of the things that he's doing with it is is, is kind of making a, a. I mean, I kind of like this idea that, that he's actually making a kind of mega budget B movie, which which I think is quite interesting. You you mentioned that it kind of anticipated this um, renaissance of disaster cinema. What, what what do you mean by that? So, um, from the mid nineteen nineties. The disaster, the disaster movie sort of makes a huge comeback in popular cinema. So you have kind of meteors hurtling towards Earth in various films. You have Deep Impact and Armageddon and all these things, and you have um, you know, alien invasions, volcanoes popping off all over the place. In the run up to the the, the, the sort of turn of the century. There's a, a whole run of films which are full of this kind of existential dread, uh, existential threat. Uh, I mean, you think, cast your mind back now to, to, to kind of that, that, that moment of the sort of late 90s or mid to late 90s and, and the sort of run up to the millennium and, and that sort of the kind of anxiety 
the sort of existential anxiety of the turn of the century. I mean, remember the millennium bug? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we get these uh, kind of yeah. overlapping techno disasters and environmental catastrophes yeah. all happening at once um, in the film. I mean, you you if you say, okay, it, it kind of anticipates disaster cinema, do you think it also anticipated this kind of um, emerging environmental uh, cultural issues that, you know, we, yeah, we I mean, kind of obsess with, with environmental issues lately? No, I, I think it did. Uh, and there's, you know, well, there's an interesting shot in the film where Dennis Nedry is kind of escaping from the Dilophosaurus, or he doesn't quite escape, does he? Um, but he he drops the, the the eggs are being carried in this aerosol. Mm-hmm. If you remember at the time, there was the whole anxiety over CFCs. Yeah, uh, and uh, and aerosols. And you have that very pointed shot of the aerosol being sort of cast out into the in, and sort of absorbed into the into the ground of the the park. Um, so I think there is you know there is sort of there's that aspect of it, but also kind of playing with nature as well. The idea of sort of uh, upsetting the natural order of things, hubristic science or hubristic scientists. Um, yeah. Uh, disturbing the natural order of you know you know and and our own you know our own place and you know our, our own place in the natural order in, in some ways what Jurassic Park does is, is is set us back down at the bottom of the food chain uh, yeah. and asks us to imagine what that would be like and that's you know a lot of Malcolm's commentary is centered on yeah. exactly that basically saying um, yeah. um, well and, and in it, later films yeah. even Wu Wu makes a similar comment you know he says something about we, you know, to a to a, a a mouse, a cat is a monster. We're just used to being the cat, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, and it's uh, an interesting com- comment from someone like Wu. Yeah, well, I mean that 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 famous line that Goldblum makes, where he says, um, "Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should," is very similar to a line in, I think, anyway, in the Towering Inferno. Uh, mm-hmm. In which, at the end, the, the, the sort of the uh, fire, you know, the fire chief, st- played by Steve McQueen, says to Paul Newman's ar- architect, "You know, there's there's no way, there's no sure way for us to fight a fire ending above the seventh floor, but you keep you people just keep building them as high as you can." It's that it's not exactly the same, but it's the same. It's it's the same kind of thing, and there are interesting. I mean, this is one of the things that kind of prompted me to think about. Jurassic Park as a disaster, you know, as a and you know, disaster film, and one which anticipates the sort of re- the return of the disaster film, in the, uh, sort of from the mid nineties, uh, is that you know, disaster cinema is a kind of large scale experiential cinema in which protagonists have to deal with these kind of threats, usually which come about as a result of man's sort of hubristic tendencies. So you have you know classic disaster films by the master of disaster, Erwin Allen, the Poseidon Adventure, or the Towering Inferno. And I think Spielberg was indebted to Allen's work. And there are references to the Towering Inferno in particular uh, throughout the film. So that opening helicopter shot, where they're, where they're sort of flying towards Jurassic Park, echoes mm-hmm. the helicopter shot from the start of uh, the Towering Inferno. We see the, t- the helicopter flying across San Francisco Bay or wherever it is. Um, yeah. To the sounds of a kind of, both to the sounds of a stirring John Williams score. Kind of, there's definitely a sort of an awareness there, I think. Not only are there sort of environmental concerns as well, but the idea of AI as well. I think, you know, we're very concerned at the minute about AI and the rise of AI and artificial intelligence. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I, I sort of thought about in the book was the idea of the the sing you know, the, the idea of the singularity mm-hmm. so back in 1993 the same year that Jurassic Park came out a guy called Werner Vinge who was i think a computer scientist or a computer theorist or in one of the big american universities i forget which now uh, sort of prophesied this idea that within 30 to 50 years artificial intelligence would develop to such a point that it would overtake and sort of make us all completely irrelevant, which kind of strikes me as 
you know, incredibly similar similar to what's going on in Jurassic Park. You have this, you know, they, they are they, these animals are AI basically. They're they're created, they're synthetically created, yeah. sort of intelligent. They're, they're artificial uh, creatures, right? So yeah, yeah. absolutely. They're, well, they're Frankenstein, right? I mean, the, 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 this is another one of the themes that kind of goes through the book as well. I think is this uh, bringing back Jurassic Park to that kind of central Frankenstein mythos. This is probably something that, you know, Spielberg, um, for all the good he did in in making the narrative more straightforward and and accessible, he he also cut away a lot of this this fat that actually some of these themes that Crichton really built in. uh, You know, Malcolm goes on for pages and pages in the novel. (laughs) At some yeah, point. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. Clearly, you can't have that in the film, but also no. it, it gives a lot more juice to some of these uh, some of these debates. Yeah, it's really stripped back. Um, but I think what's interesting is that you get sections from the book which don't appear in the first film written into the subsequent sequels. Yeah. So you get kind of, you do get those bits, maybe not the kind of yeah. the, the complex the complexities of sort of mathematical, you know, chaos. I think uh, when they were sort of developing the idea, Spielberg wanted to cut Malcolm's character altogether because he felt mm. that, that the whole chaos thing was uh, was too complex, too complex for you know, you know, a popular audience. Um, but he was convinced to kind of you know keep it in, but sort of rain down the. You know, to, to kind of condense it a little bit, you know. So yeah, but these bit, the you know, the, the the bits that don't make it from the novel are are, are sort of incorporated across um, across the next two sequels, particularly uh, Jurassic World as well, which has the bit within the uh, just sorry not Jurassic World, Jurassic Park three, which has the bit in the aviary, uh, which is brilliant. I love Jurassic Park three. I think it's great. It's so yeah. much fun. Yeah, it's it's, it's got some beautiful rap. set pieces and uh, and and the use of the the flying reptiles is is fantastic. So yeah, the pterosaurs. Yeah, because I, I I remember see that was my one disappointment. Uh, seeing Jurassic Park, the only thing that disappointed me on my first viewing of it when I went to see it when it was released was that there were no there were no flying dinosaurs in it. Because there is this, there is that fantastic scene in the Avery with Grant and the kids uh, uh, yeah. trying to make their way through the Avery in the book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but we got it. We got it in Jurassic yeah. Park three. So, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I was but, just going to say. So the, the we've we've talked a bit about the book, but the second part of this sort of project was uh, an edited edition of a journal. And yeah. you focused on the notion of expanding the Jurassic Park beyond the initial film there, franchising Jurassic Park. Uh, yeah. What what did you touch on or what did the contributors touch on in that? So journal? within that uh, book, really the, the idea behind the journal was to, I suppose, kind of develop ideas that didn't make it into the book. Or you know there wasn't room for in the book that you know that we wanted to include, that I wanted to include, but also to kind of focus more outwardly on the uh, Jurassic Park franchise itself. You know, it's because I mean I think kind of as the films have gone on, uh, they've become they've become sort of less and less critically. What's the word? Uh, critically kind of praised uh, yeah. and particularly when it comes to Dominion uh, the, the most recent film uh, which, 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 took, which was yeah. a huge success but well this is the really thing right the, the, the films are still making a billion dollars <laughs> like, well, yeah I mean but this is one of the things I kind of wanted to explore with this um, this idea of franchise cinema in the um uh, in, in, in the sort of modern era, uh, what does it mean in a world of universe, you know, in a world of sort of, you know, uh, what do they call them now? Um, oh, universes and uh, all yeah. that sort of thing, you know, where they just expand and expand and expand and sort of then you get offshoots and offshoots, you know, offshoots of this film, then offshoots of an offshoot. Um, this is a kind of a fairly new phenomenon, I think, rather than a, a kind of... Um, 
a franchise in the way we used to kind of understand it. And I wanted to kind of explore how sort of Jurassic Park or the Jurassic Park sort of franchise has kind of, you know, franchise kind of stood in relation to to uh, to these, particularly kind of, you know, post-COVID as well and uh, with Dominion. So that was certainly part of it. Um, in terms of uh, what's in the journal, we have um, a chapter by Lauren uh, uh, Chochino of, uh, called The Inher- Inheritance, the Legacy of Ellie Sattler in the Jurassic Park franchise. Mm-hmm. So it looks at the way that uh, it lo- looks at kind of female representation uh, across the Jurassic Park franchise. Uh, we've got a, a chapter on sort of... Um, Masculinity uh, in uh, in Jurassic Park by Gillian Kelly, who sort of looks at the representation of sort of male characters in 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 response to you know can every man sort of male characters in response to what she calls the kind of masculinity of the nineteen eighties. So people like Schwarzenegger mm-hmm. and big stars like Schwarzenegger and Stallone, you have a kind of a switch in Jurassic Park to the kind of the everyman, you know, the uh, the, the, the people like uh, Sam Neil. Um, uh, what else do we have? We've got um, a couple of uh, chapters on the uh, Jurassic Park video games. So I wanted to have a think mm-hmm. about you know how Jurassic Park exists outside of Jurassic Park. I wrote a chapter, an article on the unmade uh, Jurassic Park Four, John and the sort of the uh, John Sayles's uh, script for that, which kind of appeared online. Is it that's the one with the human dinosaur hybrids? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what what was interesting about that though is, is the. Um, because I'm, I'm really interested in sort of the phenomenon of the unmade film, and the, um, uh, it's, there's a lot of research going on around that at the minute. It was a really interesting book by James Fenwick, which came out, and Kieran Foster and Dave Eldridge, uh, called Shadow Cinema, on the sort of phenomenon of the unmade film. And they kind of become cult products in their own right, yeah. even though they're never finished. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what was really interesting about kind of doing the research for that was the sort of the, the sort of internet archaeology that you have to go mm-hmm. through because there's no, nothing critically written about this so you have to go to you know, the, the idea first came up in the sort of the early 2000s i think you have to go back to sort of early internet message boards and sort of excavate these kind of old kind of uh, film chat sites and things to get yeah. you know to, to, to piece the timeline together so that's interesting because it didn't it it, it didn't just, I know, it wasn't just about the, well, for me anyway, about the unmade film and, you know, how it kind of linked Park to Jurassic World, you know, laid a sort of framework for that. But it's about, you know, how people received these, you know, received films and sort of completely franchised films in the early days of the internet and how that kind of, how that changed kind of, I suppose, fan approaches. And then uh, we've got, um, chapter by Catherine Pugh on uh, eco-horror, uh, Jurassic Park and uh, the devouring Gothic. And then one by Steve Woodbridge, really interesting one, on dinosaurs and Nazis, the influence of Jurassic of the Jurassic Park franchise on popular and conspiratorial versions of history, um, mm-hmm. in which he looks at the way, you know, where and when sort of dinosaurs have cropped up in, in sort of conspiracy culture. One in particular, where the uh, the idea that the dinosaurs want the Nazis wanted to sort of resurrect the dinosaurs as a as a kind of <laughs> biological weapon. <laughs> Even as someone who uh, who who indulges in following conspiracy theories every now and then, I've not seen that one. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, uh, that'd probably be good. Yeah. Uh, you also have a chapter from a paleontologist who goes through the science behind the dinosaurs that we see in Jurassic Park. Yeah. Tell me about that chapter. So it's a really interesting chapter, and I think it kind of it sort of stands apart a little bit from the the other the other chapters um, in terms of it, it, it's written by uh, this, this paleontologist uh, Ali Nab- Nabavizade, I think. Um, but it looks at the, it takes a kind of franchise wide look at the dinosaurs, every you know all the dinosaurs from the film from a kind of scientific and paleo- paleontological 
point of view. Um, it's really kind of packed with densely packed with kind of facts and sort of dinosaur dinosaur interests. So it's 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 it, it, it's a really useful chapter to have in the book, and actually I think kind of expands the scope of the book outwards a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it's a useful uh, useful thing to have in there, and it's a really interesting. Um, it, it, I think it is really important when having these conversations, you know, we, we come at them from a film studies or media studies perspective, but it is important to bring in mm. people who, who have those other views or those other perspectives on it. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And that's uh, kind of what I try to do with the whole podcast really, is I try and yeah. mix and mix and match uh, the science with the, with the media aspect of things. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I, 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 I think as well, you know, the. I mean, let's face it, the big draw of Jurassic Park is the dinosaurs themselves, um, mm-hmm. which were sort of facilitated by the, the sort of the, the digital effects and, and ILM um, and, and the sort of the Stan Winston's animatronics. Is, uh, so uh, there, there are numerous chapters which deal with the, the sort of the importance of the dinosaurs within the, the film and the, their draw, you know, to, to dinosaur fans as well. Um, so, for instance, Ross Garner writes a chapter on uh, dinosaur fandom. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, um, uh, Janet Stasia writes about the the way that it's sort of embedded within you know Jurassic Park is kind of in, you know, became sort of embedded with a what within a wider culture uh, and became part of the sort of the vernacular the media vernacular at the time. So she looks at kind of Jurassic jokes relating to dinosaurs within the within the sort of media within various newspapers and publications. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one of the things that the other things that I was interested in with doing with the book is having people think about and write about how Jurassic Park exists outside of its kind of status as a film. So we've got uh, someone writing about theme park rides. Yeah, uh, um, Carissa Baker writing about sort of glo- global theme park experiences um, based on sort of Jurassic Park. Uh, we've got uh, um, Alison Whitney writing about uh, three, the, you know, the, the, the sort of reframing of Jurassic Park as a three D experience, as the IMAX three yeah. D experience. Uh, we've even got, you know, really interesting chapter closing the book about um, its adaptation as a kind of postmodern uh, theatrical play uh, mm-hmm. about a family who sort of recreate scenes from Jurassic Park, which was staged at a, a festival. Uh, in sort of mid two thousands, is written by Catherine Pugh. Um, so there's lots of different sort of di- you know different voices around this, but I think you know at the centre of it all is are, are the dinosaurs. It's definitely a film that has had these kind of widespread cultural effects, and the mm. the the Jurassic Park portrayal of dinosaurs has kind of become mm. the standard cultural reference for for yeah. those particular animals, for mm. the Tyrannosaurus and for the Velociraptors and the Dilophosaurus, yeah. it, you know, as much as they don't match up with the real life animals, uh, mm. you know, in a, in a pretty extraordinary way, actually. So it really does have some, some very strong influence. And there's a lot of debate yeah. out there amongst mm. um, Jurassic fans and dinosaur fans. And mm. I guess even yeah. paleontologists around yeah. the extent to which well, that's that, that, fair. Yeah. Well, <laughs> That's what Ali's chapter sort of looks to do is to kind of think about how they're represented in the film as opposed to their sort of you know real life kind of dinosaur yeah. biology and, 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 and so I think that's really interesting as well. I think one of the interesting things about uh, the, the, the sort of legacy of the film is that in its wake, you know, there was this kind of dinosaur mania, but also in, in sort of television as well. So you had documentaries like Walking with Dinosaurs, which employed a mm. kind of you know, digital, you know, dinosaur experience. You know, you had all these different sort of uh, you know, global dinosaur experiences, you know, interactive experiences and things. Um, it really did prompt a kind of sort of, uh, you know, global dino mania. 
I mean, which is uh, I think key key part of its legacy. I mean, and and that's absolutely still going. You know, we just had yeah. the Jurassic Park exhibition in Sydney, uh, yeah. and uh, and currently touring around Australia, New Zealand is a, a mm. giant Lego exhibition featuring basically life size um, life size yeah. dinosaur models built from from Lego. So, and yeah. and in fact, it is Jurassic World branded. It's it's a Jurassic yeah. World uh, exhibition. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, certainly, I think Jurassic World has. Um, continued the legacy of Jurassic Park. I mean, it, it's drawn even if the maybe the story is different or maybe not as successful. It still brings you back to Jurassic Park, and I think even though Spielberg isn't, you know, he didn't direct any of them. You know, he's embedded within them. There's that kind of you know Spielberg Spielbergian identity there. I think, uh, which I think is important. Um, I mean, for me, what you know, what what I've loved recently is that um, my I watched it with my eleven year old daughter. Well, she well, she was nine at the time, nine nine or ten at the time, uh, who saw it for the first time and loved it. So we sat down together and we watched Jurassic Park. And, mm-hmm. um, I think that's part of the appeal of the the new films as well. The idea that parents who kind of sat down with the uh, you know saw it as saw it as a child or as, as a young person can then sit down with their their own young people and sort of experience it again in a kind of new yeah. new way, which I think is really cool. One thing as well that's probably nice about the franchise is that um, you get shows like Camp Cretaceous now too, mm. which yeah. which introduced kids to the dinosaurs uh, in a in a, a more wholesome way. You know, all the even though there are still sort of deaths there. Yeah. They're, shown off screen they're not shown they're off yeah. screen so you had a kind of yeah. um softer introduction for for kids uh yeah no, absolutely i think but having said that i mean what kid has not enjoyed donald Gennaro being eaten on the toilet by a tyrannosaur look <laughs> i i have to i have to agree uh, i have to agree i think i i was only uh seven <laughs> when jurassic park came out and i'm Pretty sure I saw it at the cinema. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean that, that that that's the bit that people take away. From the film, I think, you know, particularly when you're oh, the guy gets eaten sitting on the toilet. Absolutely, and it, but it's an interesting kind of. Um, it's almost played for for humor in a way. Like oh, it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's it only is, a bit yeah. later on that you actually get the. Oh, I think this was Gennaro. <laughs> kind of yeah. expecting the wreckage. <laughs> Well, there's there's a chapter on uh, dinosaur violence in the uh, in the book uh, by uh, Je- Je- Jennifer Shell. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think she mentions the idea that she, that it kind of draws your attention away. I think it, it softens the violence. It so- it makes it more palatable. I think uh, those cartoonish moments. Um, because I know Spielberg. Well, um, I think Anne Crichton too, both kind of you know said they they weren't going to let their young children go and see it when it came out. So I think that that was quite interesting. Um, you you got to wonder how much that was playing into the um, marketing. Yeah, well, it it had a it came with a uh, a parental warning. The the, yeah. the 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 marketing campaign. So they were clearly aware that it was going to have the potential to shit kids up. Um, finally, I just want to ask one more question, and that is with the speculation that David Culp is returning to pen the franchise's seventh film, what do you think we're going to see in the future of the, the Jurassic Park franchise? Oh, we just published these two bloody things. <laughs> now they release another one, which... <laughs> And um, barely, barely a year away. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, I'm not um, sure we'll we'll get there, but a, a, a new Jurassic Park film in less than a year. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, but what what could it entail? I don't know. Um, I was thinking about this earlier. Is it going to go back to is is it going to be Jurassic World or is it going to go back to being Jurassic Park? What, I think. I think they're giving it a new name based on the 
we were talking about the internet speculation. They seem to be saying it's going to have a new name. Oh, really? So it'll be like a third. Yeah. A third, third sort of iteration to, to put in yeah. Malcolm's. <laughs> it'll be interesting. I'll be interesting to see, though, what, you know, if they go back to sales of scripts to incorporate any of those ideas in there. There was an idea for a script. I think it was, I may be mistaken about this, but there was an idea for Jurassic Park 3 before it became what it is, in which uh, Alan Grant has snuck back onto the island to protect the dinosaurs and is living a kind of Robinson Crusoe-esque sort of lifestyle yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 on the island, which I think uh, might, might be quite interesting. I have seen sort of internet mock-ups for posters in you know with with a young very young Dickie Attenborough on them uh yeah. you know uh suggesting that uh the one of the films could go back into the you know the the history of the, the Hammond character and his obsession with dinosaurs and uh, you movie. know i think that would be an interesting film but uh mm. There wouldn't be many dinosaurs, right? We're, we're talking well, yeah, about before exactly. he got around yeah. to creating them. So yeah, uh, only in his yeah. only in his imagination. So yeah. look, I guess we'll we'll have to see what uh, what comes out in Jurassic Park Seven, but um, uh, I'm sure yeah. it'll I'm sure it'll draw the audiences because uh, yeah, people do love dinosaurs on the big screen. <laughs> so Matt Miller, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so oh, much no, for thanks the chat. We'll make on. sure. Yeah, no problem at all. I'm looking forward to speaking with some of your some of your contributors to the book, uh, and we'll make sure all the details of the publication and where people can pick it up are uh, are in the show notes. Thanks so much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. That was great. Really enjoyed that. The next interview I have for you is Peter Kramer. Peter's chapter in the Jurassic Park book is called Rebellious Creations, Monstrous Animals and Unnatural Disasters, the Jurassic Park franchise and box office hit patterns. Peter, you describe Jurassic Park as a family adventure movie, part of which is concerned with subject matter associated with childhood like dinosaurs what is it about dinosaurs on screen that you think appeals to such huge audiences like we see for Jurassic Park? Well, the I had to think about this a little bit when I first received your question. <laughs> because to be perfectly honest, uh, I just took it as a given that <laughs> dinosaurs are something that children are interested in. And also, I guess, to the adults that the children grow up into. But uh, I... I haven't really explored the question why that might be the case. So mm -hmm. I am pretty sure there is a literature out there amongst okay. child psychologists or, you know, media scholars who deal particularly with children. Uh, and also, of course, the wider appeal of dinosaurs. I'm sure there is a, there is a special social science literature about it, which I don't know. So I have to admit that straight away. But uh, I, I can speculate a little bit. I mean, obviously, also in the context of your podcast and the whole project, extinction seems to be an important element. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure whether that makes any sense. Well, from what age onwards does the concept of a species going extinct make sense to a child? Uh, I'm not sure. So that would be something for the child psychologists to investigate. Mm you know, the, the knowledge about extinction. Uh, there's also, of course, the whole question of between extinct and not existing in the first place. I had to think about dragons. You know, children seem to be fascinated by dragons, which yeah. at some point they know don't exist. But have they gone extinct? Did they used to exist? So it seems to me that there's a lot of connections there. Uh, but uh, the, the, the impact of extinction as a concept i'm not sure when that starts kicking in with children obviously it's there for adults uh, but where it kicks in for children i have no idea at what age uh, the other thing is that uh, i guess the it's not dinosaurs in general it seems to me that going by my own experiences it's the it's the t-rex really 
yeah. that that is the fascination. And I think there the connection with with uh, fire spewing dragons and all that. So these are ferocious, dangerous uh, animals. Uh, so why children would be interested in that? Again, who knows? I mean, ask a child psychologist. Yeah. Um, the the other thing I thought about was that we encounter as children. Uh, I think if you're lucky enough. In my generation, coming from provincial Germany, it wasn't uh, a given that you would go to a museum of natural history and see a huge T-Rex skeleton. That was not a given. But I think for a lot of children these days, or even in the 90s when Jurassic Park came out, that was pretty much a given. You would do that at some point. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's got something to do with uh, either the skeleton or the more full reconstruction of a dinosaur of course the skeleton has the element of death built in so that's intriguing that's intriguing yeah. so maybe extinction doesn't make any sense to a young child but a skeleton and the association with death probably does so i don't know it's it's got to do with large uh, large beings that are dangerous to you maybe you know projection of the image you have of your parents at their worst uh, and it has to do with death, I think. I have seen that link to to the notion of parents and, and the kind of unknowable world out there. I mm-hmm. think my my very first guest on this podcast all the way back, uh, Bria Sachs had a book in which he described one of, that, one of those, or that exact aspect actually, this kind mm-hmm. of adult world um, maybe that dinosaurs represent for children. What you are an expert in though is cinema. And yes. uh, and the trends in and around cinema. And so in your chapter for the Jurassic Park book, mm-hmm. this is what you really do focus on. How do you think Jurassic Park impacted or shaped American cinema? Did it launch any new trends or what, what impact did it leave on the cinema? Well, I think the most obvious one is an indirect one. Well, it's direct on some level, but indirect in another because it's so self-consciously about CGI Mm-hmm. So it is about photorealistic uh, computer-generated imagery and uh, that had existed before. And actually, the, the film I would team Jurassic Park up with is Terminator 2 Judgment Day, uh, where C- photorealistic CGI was used very successfully in one particular character. And... Uh, so I think that's the main impact is, and, and Jurassic Park is very self-conscious about, you know, how it reveals. The big reveal of the first dinosaur images are very self-conscious uh, in terms of uh, people looking at something and being completely awed by it, which is, you know, in a sense, modeling what we are supposed to do in front of the screen. The people on the screen do it for us. Not that that was necessary, but, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's just one of those things that filmmakers do. They model our behavior, our response, or our hoped-for response on screen through the characters. But I, I would say it's, it's CGI that, uh, in a sense, not only the possibilities of using CGI, uh, but to the extent to which you can reshape whole cinematic worlds through CGI, completely transform them. I think, now, of course, at some point, uh, CGI, a lot of CGI is really trivial. It's like, you know, you do it, you used to do an old uh, wire trick and you just use CGI to take the wire out. <laughs> you know, you, you just cleaned up the image. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, computer manipulation of images, which is completely invisible, and it's not so spectacular or anything. Stephen Prince, I think, has written about this brilliantly. Uh, but the kind of CGI we're talking about with uh, Jurassic Park is the attempt to create images which are absolutely photorealistic, but seem unbelievable or, or otherworldly or fantastic or whatever. But they're absolutely a photo photorealistic photorealistically real as well hmm. so i think that that seems to me what jurassic park helped to 
And then, of course, it, it, it gets to the point, uh, within a few years, it gets to the point where one of the websites, is it the numbers? I can't remember which one. <laughs> So they, 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 had, they used to have categories, animation and live action. And then they had the category hybrid. And frankly, every film now is, every big movie is, is a hybrid because it's, it's, there's some live action in it. There's lots of computer generated manipulation or imagery in it. So, you know, so, so that trend towards hybrid cinema where uh, live action even in the broadest possible definition of live action, uh, you know, that something physically is, is in front of the camera, even if it's some trick or whatever. Even the broadest possible definition of live action doesn't apply to most movies anymore, most big movies anymore. Yeah. So, and I think that, that's the shift. But I said it, it was the, the double whammy of Terminator 2 in 91 and Jurassic Park in 93, it's that double whammy that made it possible. By the way, I probably have to make one exception. Apparently, Christopher Nolan, who is by far the most successful filmmaker, not only of today, possibly of all time, he apparently doesn't use CGI. I don't know how he does it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, one would have to read up on that separately, you know. Uh, yeah. So, so, so there are forms of uh, traditional trick special effects cinema uh, that you can still maintain. Uh, but I think by and large, it's, it's all, all films are high, all big films, uh, action, science fiction, fantasy, and so on. They're, they're hybrid films of their, their computer animated and live action. Yeah, so I think I that's mean, the main trend. Even um, television it, really is, is that now. Even television really is a sort of hybrid yeah, yeah. art I mean, form yeah, nowadays. I mean, at a certain point, and of course, now we have the whole debate about uh, artificial intelligence, you know, so, you know, soon enough, you know, you can probably, I don't know, you can ask a computer to create an action scene in the style of Michael Bay or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are recording this like uh, three days after after OpenAI released their Sora model, which is literally text to, text to video, uh, and I've seen a lot oh. of speculation. I, I'm not expecting you to have a lot of insight on that because I didn't put it to you in advance. But it, you know, that's a, literally uh, a lot of people online are debating about the role of that tool in uh, in filmmaking and and whether it's likely to do exactly what you said. <laughs> well, the thing is that. Uh, I don't think you needed a film to demonstrate all this. Uh, but, you know, because I, I've done a lot of work on Pixar, and that's a very convoluted story, uh, and it has to do with computer animation, but animation that looks like animation, not mm. animation that looks like photorealistic imagery. Uh, but there was no doubt that that was going to happen uh you know, eventually, but you know, Toy Story uh, came out in 1995, the first full-length, uh, um, fully computer. Well, actually, they're never fully computer generated. You know that the voices uh -huh. aren't computer generated. Oh, the voices aren't, of course. Yeah. So, uh, and I don't know about the sound effects, whether they're computer generated or traditional sound studio. You know, <laughs> using. <laughs> The, the foley, the whether the, yeah, whether, is there a foley artist? I'm sure there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that that's an interesting thing. That the vo you would think it much easier to computer generate a voice than an image, but they haven't done that, as far as I'm aware. As far yeah, there's uh, there's some really again, you know, you you you're probably not across this, but there's some really interesting work, uh, academic work, looking at. Um, things called there's a system called vocaloid which which literally is a voice generator mm. sort of system that's widely used for uh content creation in japan and you get these kind ah. of um generated or, or synthetic mm. uh idols you know mm. these pop oh, yeah, 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 yeah. who are entirely generated including their <laughs> including their voice so but even then i think you know a lot of them are based on a real set of recordings from a real person yes. Uh, and then they kind of the, modulated the 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 question of intellectual property rights, which you know mm. 
I guess the Screen <laughs> Actors Guild uh, strike and the Writers Guild strike were partly about. But but I I, I I don't think you need a Jurassic Park for this to happen. You know, and you didn't need Pixar, although Pixar, when you look at the development of the company, is such an unlikely story. But then so yeah. was Netflix, you know, and so so was Amazon, you know. So <laughs> in, in a way, these are all completely unlikely stories until they have happened. And then you think, until oh, yeah, of happened. course. Yeah. Of course it had to happen. But until it did happen, it was so completely unlikely that any of these projects would succeed. They, they are, I guess, Jurassic Park is different. If you have Steven Spielberg, most successful up to this point, the most successful filmmaker of all time, I guess, you know, at, 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 adapting a best-selling novel and using cutting-edge technology, I think you could be pretty sure that that would be a hit. So that that wasn't the kind of unpredictable thing. That that was yeah. as, sure, as surefire as you can get. So in that sense, it, it was important. But uh, I think the overall development would have happened anyway. The, now, the other thing that one might want to say is certain kind of disaster, mm-hmm. a certain kind of ca- catastrophe. Now, the, you know, disaster movies were big in the 70s, uh, but they also were taken to another level uh, in fantasy and science fiction with Star Wars, you know, a whole planet explodes. Uh, in Superman as well, the whole planet explodes. And then what is it that <laughs> California <laughs> falls into the ocean or something? But that's a different kind of disaster. And I think Jurassic Park goes back to an older model of disaster movie. But the question is, did it actually become very successful? That kind of, you know, it's a, a smallish group of people in a limited location that they can't get away from. And then some force, usually of nature uh, or of man-made, reconstructed nature, breaks out and brings about death and destruction. I'm not sure whether... Because, you know, the next big, the really, really big films are films like Armageddon, where it isn't. The confined location is Earth. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. And the same in Independence Day. So I'm not sure whether, you know, the revival of certain kind of large-scale destruction movies uh, at the top of the charts. I'm only ever talking about the top of the charts because if you look at the overall output of Hollywood, who knows? And it's hundreds of films every year. How could you possibly know, you know what all these films are? But when you look at the top of the charts, uh, since the late 70s, large-scale destruction, uh, really large scale destruction was was quite prominent. I think mm, it becomes more mm. prominent in the nineties. But uh, Jurassic Park is more. I think Matt talked about this uh, more a throwback to the more localized disaster movies of the seventies. So I'm not sure whether it exerted such a big influence in, in that respect. That's a really interesting logic because I I I, I fully agree with you. One of the challenges that the Jurassic filmmakers have had in their sequels is not telling the same story again and again and again. Uh, the Lost World and Jurassic Park 3 and Jurassic World and and to a certain extent Fallen Kingdom and even Dominion all told the same story, which is basically the dinosaurs rampaging against a small group of humans in a relatively confined location notwithstanding the Tyrannosaurus running through San Diego at the end of, of the Lost World. Um, but, but those things are kind of, they've struggled to break out from the, from the island, in a sense, uh, even though they've kind of wanted to, but they've, they've struggled the filmmakers to find a way. But the series still is a big draw card. You know, it's a, it's a billion-dollar series, I think. Uh, globally, all of the films make... Uh, and all well, the, the films on average have made a billion dollars. And there's now a new one expected in 2025, which comes pretty soon after Dominion. Do, do you think it's a film franchise that can continue to be at the top of the box office or is it going to struggle against these other uh, big film franchises? To be perfectly honest, I had lost track of it. I didn't like the second one very much, uh, nor the third one. And I didn't feel 
the third one making any impact whatsoever. Although I was surprised when I did the research, I thought, oh, actually, you're surprisingly successful. Yeah. Uh, and I would have never thought you could revive it. So I think this is one of those franchises uh, that I thought was, you know, diminishing returns very quickly and then it's gone, that they revived it. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I have had no idea that you could do that. But then again, you know, how can you make a sequel to uh, Top Gun? You know what I mean? What's that all yeah. about? And it's good. I didn't yeah. like the first one, but I really yeah. liked the second one. And it's really good. And it was super successful. Who would have thought? <laughs> or, or the most extreme example recently, that uh, Avatar 2, which I didn't like at all, although I loved the first one, you know, is is by, you know, any standards, I guess the third most successful film of all time now <laughs> at the global box office, not in, adjusted for inflation. Uh, so who knows? I mean, I, I think I there, there used to be, a, there used to be rules, like a sequel always makes less money mm-hmm. than the, the film before. That doesn't apply to James Bond series, the James Bond series. That, fun, that had a different logic because it wasn't uh, a continuing story uh, until recently. It's more serialized, until, yeah, yeah. Until recently, I think the Daniel Craig one, the way I understand it, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big Bond fan, but the Daniel Craig ones were connected, at least the first two were closely connected. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so there used to be rules about sequels. Uh, but they, they stopped, for example, Matrix 2 made more money than <laughs> Matrix 1. And I thought, this is impossible. Mm. How can this be? You know, because the second one, you have to have seen the first one many times to have any <laughs> chance to understand the second one. But then you'd say, oh, yeah, because it's of DVD or whatever. You know, people bought the DVD who hadn't seen the first film. They watched it before they watched the second, whatever. So, so there were all kinds of rules which, which have been broken. And the more we look at it, uh, the more the rules we thought they existed have gone out of the window. So I make absolutely no prediction. Now even the Marvel <laughs> thing, the, the rule of Marvel seems to come to an end. You know, I didn't see that coming. I did not see that coming. Yeah, they. Uh, that was a really interesting one because it felt like this juggernaut that was just unstoppable uh but Mm. now yeah a lot of those a lot of those films are really struggling you noted in your chapter that uh lots of those really popular films feature humanities creations and you've already mentioned the disaster film but you also pointed out things like robots and monsters turning against the creators as a sort of subset of those disaster films why do you think that attracts audiences why why are those successful well well, i think there's two reasons first of all that's what Myth and religion is all about, isn't it? I mean, you yeah, know, the so, challenging humanities, challenging the gods and getting whacked for it, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know much about Greek myth, but I think there's a fair amount of Greek myth where, where this kind of thing happens. Uh, except, of course, the one that is very prominent right now because of Oppenheimer, Prometheus. He was punished, mm. not so much <laughs> the humans. The, 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 the one who stole the fire from the gods and gave it to the humans was punished. But usually it's the, it's the humans doing something naughty and getting punished, like being kicked out of paradise and things like that. You know, minor things like that. Uh, so that's both Greek myth and religion. You know, the tower to the, building the Tower of Babel and all these kinds of things. So I think it's deeply rooted in the way human beings have always uh, conceived of the world around them. There are higher mm-hmm. forces at work, and you better be in harmony with them because otherwise they're going to get you. Yeah. So, so it's not about creations, but it is about any kind of challenge to those higher forces uh, is, is dangerous. So I think that is so deeply rooted uh, in in human beings. Uh, but the other thing, of course, that I point out in my chapter has to do with uh, starting in the United States, apparently, although it's difficult to get global um, opinion polls, but in the United States, 
within a few years, in the mid to late 60s, when they first started asking about environmental issues in opinion polls, uh, it immediately became a, a, a very important issue. It, it, you know, it, it's astonishing because, you know, we're still struggling with environmental issues. But in the late 60s, everyone was talking about it and opinion. Oh, yeah, yeah it's very important. Uh, so it starts in the States and then it spreads around the world. This kind of awareness of environmental destruction that what we do to the environment, as it were, uh, will be done to us ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and and I try to say, is it coincidence that some of these mega hits uh, appear around similar issues to do with uh, disasters, natural disasters or, or unnatural disasters or creations to, to turning against the creators or monstrous animals that a lot of that happens in this in, in Hollywood cinema at the at the top of the charts and Interestingly, even more pronounced on television, the top rated films on television uh, in the United States in the 70s, many of them are of that kind. And yeah. uh, so I, I would say, well, that would be a strange coincidence, but it, it's a tricky one to establish causality here. There's something going on whereby... Uh, for all kinds of reasons, there is a heightened awareness that uh, modern societies uh, use up resources in a way which is not sustainable. Uh, they destroy things that they depend on in the process of, you know, sustaining themselves. And that awareness runs parallel uh, to movies that you know, in many different ways. I mean, Planet of the Apes is an interesting one because you only found out, find out at, at the end. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, nuclear war, sure. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, but actually, in the first one, you don't even find out it's nuclear war. I think you have to wait for the second one. But you can guess in the first one uh, that it must have been a nuclear war. Uh, that's, of course, the other thing that goes back to the mid-40s uh, or the late 40s the awareness of the threat of nuclear war, which would be the ultimate environmental catastrophe. I, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? The the environmental concerns have shifted and changed over time. So, you know, the, the direct concerns about radiation, uh, but then also we had things about um, land clearing and sort of visible air pollution was another that kind of became very common. And, and now uh, climate change is the permeating environmental concern uh, I think for for most people and something like don't look up really takes that as its central metaphor even when the natural disaster in the film is a is a comet uh, mm. you know something that we couldn't avoid as such but yeah. uh, it, we we choose to ignore it instead of preparing so I think it's yeah. a mixture absolutely it's a mixture of deep Deep-rooted mythological religious themes, there's the overarching sense since the late 40s that a nuclear war could end everything. Uh, and then there's the more specific concern, which comes, I mean, the, the book that is always said to have launched the modern environmental movement in the States, uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, equates the effect of pesticides and insecticides with nuclear radiation or radioactivity. Mm. And it makes very clear the connection between the two. And uh, so the modern environmental movement is informed by, you know, deep mythological religious themes the nu by nuclear anxiety, but also just the reality of, you know, polluted rivers and air and everything, yeah. which, be which became so obvious. And there were a few disasters in the late 60s in the States, but then it spreads around the world. And, uh, you know, th this awareness and, and the fact that it is human created, uh, e even with climate change, despite all the denialism, uh, by and large, the world's population, uh, representative surveys have found that people say, yeah, yeah, it's happening. Yeah, and it's probably mostly or largely to do with human uh, activity, 
I, I think all of this uh, became uh, the norm worldwide uh, over a few decades, uh, this kind of view. And uh, so the, the kinds of films we, we've been talking about, uh, in a sense, play on that. They, mm. they, they reflect it or they heighten it or, you know, or provide cathartic release. I don't know. But in so many different ways, they do that. And the, the, but I think the, the specific question about Jurassic Park is a slightly different one. And I, I haven't really, uh, in a different context, I've thought about these things, but not with Jurassic Park itself. Yeah. So, uh, so I think uh, Michael Crichton is, is a very interesting figure. And it is, I was surprised when I looked up, you know, on Google Scholar, Google Books, you know, what had been written about him. There wasn't that much uh, that I could find. Uh, and uh, certainly not, not many overviews of his oeuvre. You know, he's also mm. co-creator of ER, one of, you know, the best television series ever. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he, he's he's a seminal figure. But he's, when he's probably under, Park, underappreciated, right? yeah. He's probably underappreciated, absolutely. In terms of uh, academically underappreciated, yeah, I think you're exactly yeah, right. Because I think academia has problems with these kinds of... He's sort of... He's not out and out trash, you know. He's sort of middle bro, and I think academics hate the middle bro the most. <laughs> if it's out and trash, yeah, yeah, whatever, we can deal with it. If it's high literature, yeah, yeah, that's good. But you know, anything somewhere in the middle with footnotes, you know what I mean? With footnotes, <laughs> he has endless footnotes in some of his novels. Uh, so I think the the Jurassic Park book books. There are something to do with playing God uh, and interfering in creation, uh, and that uh, backfires, I guess. And just to just to circle back again slightly, the, your comment about the uh, the attraction of of religious titles and themes, even though it's not in it's it's a theme in Jurassic Park, but actually they really foreground that in the title of the Lost World. You know, that's almost a that's almost a reference to Eden. Uh, and then later on in Fallen Kingdom, that's obviously a fairly clear reference to uh, kind of uh, humans again leaving Eden and being fallen, fallen uh, creatures, I guess. Uh, within, God. and then you get Dominion, uh, which is which is again to me quite clearly a very loaded, uh, religious, religiously connotated term. Uh, as well. So even in Jurassic Park, we see that explicitly, not just inherently in the themes that that notion of um, the Greek epics and the religious epics yeah, and those kinds I of things play out. That that's what what you would expect. Uh, that's one of my uh, not theories, but one of my conclusions about American cinema, because the the World Value Surveys which started with a limited group of countries, I think in the 70s, and then at some point it, it covered most uh, of the world's population. They show very clearly that religiousness tends to go down when uh, the GDP goes up, as it were. <laughs> uh, and uh, so there is a, a negative correlation between uh living standards uh, and religiosity and the one where this is least in evidence is the united states uh so the united states remained a, a fairly deeply religious society for much longer than you would expect uh so although filmmakers in hollywood come from anywhere in the world uh some of the key decision makers, studio heads, uh, and uh, and also most uh, the writers are uh, actually I think the the writers of top movies are more consistently American than the directors or the actors or whatever. So I think there is something uh, that is very close to Americans, 
uh, even if you're not religious yourself, yeah, y- you know, you're bound to pick up on the religiosity of the surrounding society. So, for no good reason what whatsoever, you make a Terminator sequel and you just say, "Well, let's call it Judgment, Judgment Day." Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or let's make an asteroid movie. Let's call it Armageddon. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not even that you you mean anything by it, but it's just so deeply rooted in that particular society, not just in, you know, the West in general or humanity in general. It's so particularly uh, alive still in the United States that I think these these things happen. But I think that gives Hollywood a particular strength Mm -hmm. because Hollywood is more inclined to put in these mythological religious dimensions than filmmakers in, in most other countries. And it, it becomes a then, yeah, it becomes a kind of soft power wedge uh, of American soft power then uh, as well. Yeah, I guess you could call it that. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, But I don't mean it in a, in a sort of negative way. I just mean it, uh, but of course, you know, when you look around, because I'm very interested in Chinese blockbusters, and of course you know that in The Wandering Earth, it's the Chinese mm-hmm. who save the day, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's no longer the Americans. And uh, I don't know what religious uh, framework there is, but I can't see much um, much familiar things. But maybe I have to think about it again. And the three body problem will be very interesting because you know it, it was made in, uh, written in China, and uh, the original there, there's two series, uh, Chinese adaptations of the first and second novel, but now of course the Netflix has remade it, mm. and uh, I think there the Americans are saying, "Hey, hang on a moment, hang on a moment, we can't leave this to the Chinese," you know. <laughs> Peter, we have ranged uh, well beyond Isla Nublar and uh, well beyond the dinosaurs, but it has been an absolutely fascinating discussion uh, uh, kicked off by your your chapter, the Jurassic Park franchise and box office hit patterns. Thank you very much for joining me on Fossils and Fiction. Thank you for having me. Um, Thanks so much to Matt Melia and Peter Kramer for their fascinating conversations. Honestly, Peter and I talked for a very long time about global cinema, but a lot of it got so far away from the point of this podcast that I just had to do a cut. Perhaps it's time for a Patreon where I can release those extended interviews. Uh, We'll see. Thanks so much for joining me. First episode of Fossils and Fiction for 2024. Just a reminder, this is part one of the chat about the Jurassic Park book edited by Matt Melia. We'll have the next part in coming weeks. Take care. Thanks for listening. Find more info on the web at fossilsfiction.co and across social media. Follow and rate us on your favourite podcasting platform. If you have a story to share on the podcast, please get in touch. The theme music is Sonora by Lucas Moreno.